This is episode 57 of the Wilderness Locals podcast. On this episode, Wacy and I sit down with our brother from another podcast, Adam Yonke. Adam is the founder of the Journal of Mountain Hunting. I was getting tired of no one else hearing our two hour long random phone conversation, so we decided to hit record on this one. This podcast is brought to you by Kafaru International, the toughest hunting gear on the planet, bar none. Frontiersman gear, high quality, completely custom, handmade knives made in the heart of the peace country. And as always, we're brought to you by Just Shooting Arrows. Are you tired of hauling your bikes in the back of your camper? <laughs> Get yourself a Ram 1500. <laughs> 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 I did that, I, uh, that's I did that the whole way home. My wife was ready to kill me. Oh, I love it. One of the, um, one of the guys at, uh, Wild Sheep Society of BC, Trevor, we were at uh, an event, this could probably going back two years and I'd done a podcast when I had this horrible sort of throat thing going on <laughs> and he thought his kids were asleep. So he's listened to beyond the kill and all of a sudden he hears, he hears his daughter kind of wake up in the back of the truck and she's like, daddy is that Batman? Cause I sounded like <laughs> Christian Bale and like, what, whatever, one of the, one of the three he was in. I'm like, you know what? That could have been the best compliment I think I've ever heard about my podcast. And that's what I sound like. I'm, I'm, I'm down. Yeah. You're winning. <laughs> <laughs> that's wicked. <laughs> and they're oh, all the man. same. They're it, all the same. Them, them truck commercials it cracks me up. Yeah. Yeah. They're so but funny. That, uh, that guy, not, I always want to say it's Sam Shepard. It's not Sam Shepard. It's the guy with the big bushy ass mustache that, that you sound so much like when you do, uh, do those cuts or those oh. takes. Well, Wacy's Wacy, mm. coming for the title. <laughs> <laughs> I think my calling is doing random commercials. Like yeah. that's my thing. <laughs> just, just anything that says motor trend in it, you have dialed. <laughs> Motor I was saying hi to the before, year. You, before you got on, I'm like, every year they come out with a new tailgate. I think we've reached the pinnacle of pickup trucks. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's right. But Ford still can't seem to build a build a fucking tie rod. But anyways, that's that's beside the point. Yeah. Uh, uh, on this episode of Truck Wars, <laughs> Dodge enthusiast Adam Yonke. <laughs> I should have stuck on the shed. <laughs> really, eh? Yeah. Anyways, oh man, people get so bent out of shape about about uh, their <laughs> brand. You know, like what 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 brand bow you shoot, what what brand truck you drive. It's you know what pack you well, use. You get well. The- hold on. What 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 brand camo you wear? Of course. Ooh, I mean, come on. Yeah. That let's one's let's just start country. right there, boys. That one's heavy. Mm-hmm. 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 You, those uh my my young sheep buddies there jeff agostino and, and the nanny boys as i like to call them they uh <laughs> they they love themselves some cool you and they get real upset oh, yeah. if you make fun of them i'm just kidding i like it all yeah I'm, i might have some inside info as to uh just just how strong that kool-aid has to be but uh we'll just we'll just leave that one hanging <laughs> cool <laughs> so Adam Yonke, we got we got you on the blower. That's right, man. That's cool. Uh, I'll, I, I got to admit, it's a lot more relaxing to be on the other side of the mic, so to speak, for once, and not have to, you know, prep and worry about you know holding the conversation or anything like that. So uh, I might just give you guys a whole bunch of dead air here and make you really work for it today. It, <laughs> I, it's it's I, tough. I, hey, it's tough with some people because if you get a guy that's real chatty. Uh, he can carry the conversation for most of the podcast, but if you get a guy that, mm-hmm. you know, he don't say a bunch, it's tough to keep the conversation going. It worries me too. A little oh, bit yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, th- though, a lot of these podcasts, I do, I do many, many hours of research and take all kinds of notes for, and I don't ever plan the conversation, but I'll have some points I want to hit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. However, with you, Adam. This mm-hmm. is one of those podcasts that I have been able to do zero hours of research because over the past few months, you and I have become, become friends, become buddies. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. whenever we get on the phone, it takes about two and a half hours for us to, to get to the point of talking about which that, that we were actually trying to talk about what the phone call was for. Cause we all, <laughs> we, true. you have so much to say. And, uh, that's one of the reasons why I've been looking forward to doing this podcast with you so much is to get you, uh, in the other seat at the, uh, podcast table, you know? 
Yeah. Well, I uh, appreciate it, man. And, uh, I don't know if having lots to say is, uh, is as commendable as uh, you know, a kid saying that I sounded like Batman when I, my throat was dying, but, um, it's funny. My, um, I have my, both my brother's family and sister's family are, are visiting town this week and my sister and her husband were having a little fun, like, you know, laughing sort of bickering session last night is you know, after, after we all got the kids down and, uh, it came out that, um, she's she has far too much to say as well but whether that's in email format or when <laughs> asked a question and my wife is like yeah, i think that's a yonky thing so uh, good luck with that it could be mm. it could be maybe i don't know so one uh, of the one of the first things i wanted to <clears throat> talk about mm -hmm. is why did you start the journal how did that how did that come about and then how did it evolve into a podcast and everything else <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I mean, the, the good old fashioned scratching my own itch really was, was the answer. And there, there's a, you know, a, a, not a deeper, but a more, uh, I guess, important um, component to it as well. But that was, so the, the journal will be, will have been around for seven years uh, in August of, of this year. Um, and so, you know, that's going back to, um, a time when I was, um, living in Vancouver, um, and was just like, I mean, I had the sickness for mountain hunting and, and, you know, I, I grew up on, in Ontario, Eastern Ontario, but in our West Ottawa, uh, very rural, awesome, um, part of the province to grow up and, um, wasn't, wasn't a mountain hunter at all. I, I mean, I grew up hunting, fishing, trapping, live, living outside. We, we, we lived on a farm, so my life was outside. Um, so I was, you know, outdoorsy, but, um, you know, mountain hunting or even the idea of mountain hunting wasn't really something that, um, that, that you know, I grew up with. So when I moved to Van Vancouver or the West coast, I guess, um, and started to really, uh, learn about and open my eyes to the crazy opportunities out here. Um, I, I went deep. Like, I mean, I was literally obsessed. And, and at the time, because like, because I didn't grow up with it and I didn't have a, you know, a mentor or anyone to show me the ropes of mountain hunting. Like I'd, I'd hunted a lot, um, but not backpack hunting or, or anything like that. Um, I was, uh, you know, stuck with the options that were out there at the time for, you know, researching, you know, areas and hunting techniques and just, you know, tips and everything and, and, and gear and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so the, the sources of information at the time were, you know, reasonably limited. There was hunting BC, the forum that, that still, I think is going strong today, mm -hmm. yep. uh, rock slide, which, you know, most people that are in this space will be, will be quite familiar with. So two forums. And then when it came to like more in depth, content, like not a, whatever, couple hundred words sort of article or really, like, you know, just reading through page after page after page of forum posts, the bulk of the content was coming from companies like Sitka and Kuyu, right? So I would, you know, in my email inbox, I'd see a, a, a post, uh, like a blog post come up from Sitka or, or Kuyu. And back in the day, Jason Hairston was doing a crazy amount of content, like before he even launched Kuyu, right? Mm -hmm. He had that whole building Kuyu blog that was so, so smart of him to do. Um, that was what I kind of lived for, right? As far as my, my research, but it was kind of limited, right? Like those, you know, the, the people from those brands would go out on hunts, they come back with awesome photos and awesome stories, but those would come into your inbox. I don't know, like once every couple of months, if you were lucky. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted more. And, um, I remember this so well, I was driving down to, uh, Portland, which is where my uh, in-laws live. And, uh, we done the, <clears throat> pardon me, the leave after work. Uh, my, uh, son, my, my first and only son at the time. Now we've got two, but my son Hudson was sleeping in the back. Julia and my wife is dozing off in shotgun and then my wheel, wheels are just spinning. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, the idea of an online, I, I thought of it as an, on, and we still do kind of think of it as an online quote unquote magazine, although that, that sort of concept has changed quite a bit in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. But the idea of a, you know, of a digital magazine focused exclusively on mountain and backcountry hunting just kind of popped in my head. I'm like, well, I don't know shit about any of that stuff, but, uh, maybe, maybe I can figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that was the inspiration. And, and, and alongside that was, 
you know, those that have kids will probably know that that's a bit of a bit of a shakeup in your world as far as what you what you want from life and what you want to do and how you want to spend your time. And I was working as a a clinician back then. I I own my my own business in that space and had just sold it. I was working with the company in a transitional phase, but I knew I wasn't going to be with them for long. Like I was going to see out the the whole you know commitment on helping them transition, mm-hmm. and then I was going to then I was going to make a change and you know my wife looked at me one day and I'm on hunting BC for like the 30th hour that week. (laughs) And she's like, why don't you just do something like with that? Like, I mean, for God's sakes, channel this into something that is at least possibly worthwhile. Cause all you're doing is burning time on hunting BC right now or Mm -hmm. these other sites. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, 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 the kind of the, I guess the beginnings of it. And then, um, I don't know, shortly after that. So that's what's, what are we, 2021? So, you know, back then podcasting was, was certainly out there, but it wasn't anywhere close to what it is yeah. today. Yeah. And um, there were a few podcasts I was really, really into. I'm uh, utterly and completely obsessed with podcasts. Um, mm-hmm. Have been since I first kind of stumbled onto them and still am to, to this day. And I just knew that that was something that, um, you know, I was really into and and two, I thought would be a really great form uh, of content to add to uh, what had become, you know, this, you know, uh, online written content and, you know, imagery uh, focus that we'd had with the journal. So I think it was about a year after, you know, we'd started publishing content that uh, I decided to launch the podcast and, and it's, it's turned out to be probably more important than the, than the written content is now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's easy to kind of um, it, it's podcasts are just so palatable, you know, guys can hop on for an hour and, and listen to one in completion. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think, you know, for for our community as well, it's it, it's a really interesting you know, uh, I guess just option, right? Cause what, what, what do all of us do? We spend a lot of time in our vehicles, right? Mm-hmm. If we're driving to our hunting spot, we're driving out somewhere to, you know, hike or do whatever. And I mean, you know, spade a spade, most of, most of the world pre, uh, you know, COVID spent a lot of time commuting to and from the office, mm-hmm. right? And it's one thing to sit down and write something. And, you know, we had a lot of people that would reach out to us and be like, oh yeah, you know, I really want to write a story about, you know, such and such hunt. But I just, I've never written before. I don't think I can do it. And we'd say like, look, sit down, just start, like just start writing something and send it over. You don't need to make it perfect. Just get us the nuts and the bolts and we can clean it up to make it, you know, publishable from our end. Um, a lot of people would do that, but at the same time, it's a hell of a lot easier to get a guy to sit down on a microphone or through their, you know, their earbuds on their phone and have a chin wag. Right. So it also made making content a lot easier and allowed us to bring a lot more people into the fold that, you know, we couldn't really, you know, share their stories because they didn't want to write. And, you know, we weren't doing a lot of video content back then. And uh, it just made a lot of sense. And, I, and I'm, I'm so glad that we, uh, that, that I, that I did it. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. It's, uh, it's developed a pretty sweet following and, and now you have, uh, you've got Nolan aboard and, and, uh, uh, the doc there aboard uh, making content for you guys too. You have a great thing going. Yeah. I mean, it's, <clears throat> pardon me. It's, um, it's been fun, man. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not really much of a solo dude. Like, you know, I, I we put up a post on the journal feed about, you know, pranks and that sort of stuff right in the, in the back country or with when you're out hunting with your buddies. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've got, a, I know a few guys that are, are pretty diehard on the solo hunting side of things. And, I think it's badass. I just, you know, I love being out there with, with, you know, one other guy or a couple other guys and yeah. you know, that, that sort of group group environment. The same thing goes with, with business, you know, like I, I, I just would much rather do it with a solid group of people than try and be some sort of, you know, solo printer type, type dude. And I, you know, I really, um, I never wanted the journal of mountain hunting or even the podcast for that matter to be, about me like mm-hmm. this was never meant to be the, the great white hunting journal of adam yonke yeah. right it was <laughs> it was it was honestly like it was never about some of the content you know i think from you know my background or some of the, the backgrounds of a lot of the people i know really well we definitely uh voiced really strong opinions about this 
makes sense and this doesn't make sense. But most of it was us sourcing information from others to share. So, you know, I could learn really selfishly. Um, and then, you know, if we were, we had questions about whatever it was, you know, guns, gear, et cetera. Um, there were probably others that did as well. So it was never meant to be this, you know, soapbox for me to get up on. Unfortunately with the podcast, you know, I was the cheapest labor I could hire. And so <laughs> I, you know, I became the voice of it there. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I was really happy to bring, you know, Nolan on and then Wardo in the last, uh, you know, year or so to add to that contact content, bring other voices to the mix, different backgrounds, different, you know, perspectives and, you know, also makes my job easier, which is great too. Yeah, right? cool. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know it's, it's funny. You said that like, um, using the podcast as a tool to selfishly learn, like I'm, uh, I'm just going through my gear list for, um, our upcoming goat hunt here. And I'm like going through my layering system and I was like, I'm going to text John Barclow and get him to come on the podcast. <laughs> and I'm just going to ask him all of my questions. He's like, sure. Ty sounds good. I'm like, <laughs> like, yeah, you awesome. know, who's going to have a dialed layering system. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. no, I, I totally get it, man. That's, that's awesome. And, and you, you guys have had the, um, the I don't I don't know if I want to say great fortune, but you guys have had the ability to work with some really awesome brands like um, like Beyond. I mean, Barclay was at Beyond for a long time, right? Yeah, he was. I mean, if, 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 you know, for the listeners, if you've only heard Barclow on, you know, on, on Wilderness Locals or even, um, did he talk about it on ours? I, I had him on two or three times. I can't remember. He's been on Kafaro cast a bunch, obviously. I mean, mm-hmm. he's, he's done the rounds of late but Barclow, you know, admits himself. He kind of got dragged into the public eye pretty unwillingly, but uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm real glad that he, he, he did so. Cause he's just an absolute, he's just a great guy. Oh, period. he's the best. But so, so, so knowledgeable and, uh, and yeah, he, he's got a really cool, cool backstory and, and yeah, it was, uh, he got his start in apparel at Beyond Clothing and, um, and, uh, and then obviously made the leap to, to Sitka, which is obviously, I think turned out really well for him. But mm-hmm. I mean, we, we've, we've worked with a lot of really cool brands, you know, my, my, brother-in-law as an example he's on the design team at, at first light he used to be at arcteryx on the the leaf side like the law enforcement yeah, armed cool. forces design side and then um decided to leave them and um and yeah i got picked up by by first light and uh and and we were just talking here while they were visiting um the for one of the very first companies we ever worked with was first light <laughs> this is kind mm-hmm. of a, a funny story so like you know we got the the journal off the ground in august of uh 2014 and um you know i went into it with you know one i had no idea if, if it was gonna land at all right like was this thing gonna just absolutely positively fall flat on, on its face and um you know figured out how to get a, a very basic web st- a website going using one of those you know I can't say embarrassing, but at the time they weren't very, they, they weren't very, uh, functional, like drag and drop website builder sort of, sort of templates. For right? $9 a month, you two could have a website. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Right. You know, it, it ta- we see this is when you could actually insert your, your Dodge Ram commercial voice, but for websites, if, if you want, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, anyways, uh, you know, when, um, when we, when we got it, got it going, it, um, I had no idea if it was going to, going to land at all. Right. And so we, we'd done like, I don't know, three months of, of content. And back then we were doing it in like magazine format, right? There'd be a set number of articles. I think it was like 10 covering a set set of subjects, kind of like a column in a, in a newspaper or a magazine. Right. Um, and so we'd only put out like three months of stuff. All of a sudden I get this email come in and it was from first light. I think it was actually Call- uh, Callahan, Ryan. Um, and uh, the, the, it was really simple. It was like, um, we really like what you're doing. Please send us a media kit. My response was like, sure thing. And the next step was Google. What is a media kit? <laughs> like I, I, had, I had no clue, right? Like I had no clue. I, uh, I didn't know anything about you know, publishing or advertising or any, any of that sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, the point being that first light, like we weren't even ready to offer like a banner ad or anything like that. And, um, 
they were in right away and we worked with them for, I want to say two years. Uh, and then we worked with Sitka and, um, you know, a, a number of other brands over the years. So, um, yeah, we've been, I, I would say have, have had the good fortune of, um, getting exposure to a lot of, a lot of cool companies, a lot of great people at those companies, a lot of cool gear to, to test and figure out. And it's, I, I love that part of it. Like, um, I don't know if I can say I'm a gear nerd. Um, but I can I really say you're like, a gear nerd. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I'm in the same boat though, Adam. No worries. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't, I take it as a compliment. I'm just not sure if I'm that much of a nerd to, to self-identify as one, you know? I don't know. I, I've talked, I've talked technical clothing with you before and it gets real nerdy real quick. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the nerd label. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's so fun. I mean, even like from a from from a non-business side, even just playing in this space as a hobbyist, but kind of in the inside, you know, you get mm -hmm. you get so much knowledge out of people that you chat with because like all of these podcasts that we do. I mean, we hop on here, we record an hour and then they usually run for another hour <laughs> to just shooting the shit after. Right yeah it's so yeah it's so fun yeah it's one of those things that, you know um <clears throat> yeah i listened to uh, uh andy stump's podcast clear it hot a lot one of my oh, favorite yeah. podcasts yeah. by Me far too. He, he often says at the start like someone someone the, or the guest will ask like are you recording he's like oh yeah i've been recording for like 10 minutes and he'll say something to the effect of you know i learned early that some of the stuff that comes up when you know, either you don't plan for, you know, the official interview or the guest isn't sure if the mics are rolling, um, is just solid gold, right? And not, that's not to like catch someone. It's just, you know, sometimes it changes, right? The microphone, yeah. you know, it's like, mm -hmm. we are officially recording and then you can just see people kind of like, Ooh, geez, like they kind of get nervous. Right. So mm -hmm. it's always, I think, good to have, um, uh, some of that, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it impromptu or, or casual yeah. stuff included. And then, yeah. but you, like you were saying at the same time, the stuff that comes after the mics turn off is, is also often just phenomenal. Yeah. You know, for, Not for, to talk me, about for me, I like, um, I, I don't listen to anything. <laughs> I just, what we do here, I'll listen to the odd one of these. Cause I just, I kind of don't want anything to really influence what I'm saying. Right. Cause I want it to just be me, you know, when I'm talking, I'll listen to the odd Kafaru cast or whatever with Aaron. If, if, if he's got some good ones, but other than that, I'm pretty, pretty radio silent for the most part. I'm the extreme opposite end of the spectrum. I listen to everything and anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just so, like to, like, yeah. I have, I have my, I have what I need in my, in my mind, what I, <clears throat> what I need for hunting. I don't, I'm not really hunting for new info anymore. It seems like mm -hmm. I'm kind of just, I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty happy where I'm at with things. So I'm not really like the, like there's a, there is a big thirst for, for, uh, content and it's for a lot of the younger guys coming in they're hungry they want to learn right so that's where this stuff comes in handy oh man yeah <laughs> you're gonna laugh yonki you like this okay just a quick sidebar <laughs> so we're getting organized for this this goat hunt and uh we've added a fourth man to it it's my buddy jonathan and he's not a real experienced hunter but he's like a super experienced backpacker mountaineering type dude like not a liability at all right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i started a group chat with all four of us in it and i'm like okay let's talk about gear here everybody hates group chats but let's make sure you know we're not all packing three-man shelters up up the mountain and you know let's get organized right mm -hmm. wacy just fires in the most standard wacy comment i've ever seen in my entire life he says let me know where i need to be and when i need to be there i'm ready Exits chat. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch. Oh, I love it. It's like when I, I, when, when I say, uh, when I say I, I'm ready, I mean, I, I, I was fucking ready for this shit in May, like to go, like, like I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm fucking ready. I was born ready. Like, like this is my life. Like, this is what, this is what I do. So like, yeah, I'm fucking ready. Like, let's go now, you know? <laughs> and there's, there's so much, uh, I guess, well, value, I guess would be one way to put it, but, um, 
it's nice we see like i find myself like you know i guess catching myself before a hunt of like like what are you like obsessing over like i i've done enough of these fucking things that mm-hmm. i could could pack in an hour if i need to um but i still get like swept up in the oh, what about this what about this you know blah 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 and that like i i love that part of the hunt but at the same time i also hate that part of the hunt like the the pre the pre part where it's like a, you know thinking about and then especially in like a group setting you know somebody's asking about this this or this and you're like oh fuck i didn't really think about that like i guess i could shave one one gram off of a bar but i don't fucking need to do that like let's just get going you know like it's uh i, I tip my hat to you on that one way see because it's there's yeah. there's like i guess peace in uh not having to overthink the thing and just you know strap on the pack and get out there and see what see what happens mm-hmm. yeah if i got, if I'm if not, I got I, if I got food and somewhere to sleep, man, I'm good. Let's let's get at her. Yeah, let's I'm not do. there. I'm like I, I'm making I'm making lists and getting dialed. I'm not quite at the level of dudes that are uh, counting ounces and stuff like that. If it's in my pack, I need it, and uh, I'll roll pretty Spartan like that. But um, uh, I'll, I'll have many panic attacks if I don't make a list, you know. So yeah, well, and I think you know, coming way. So you made the comment about the. Um, you know, whether it's young guys or old guys that are coming in into the space, you know, if you think back on the options, you know, available to us, you know, like I said, when the journal started you know, seven years yeah. ago, there just wasn't that much nope. stuff available. You go back even further. Like I think about my, my whitetail hunting growing up and it was, well, I knew I needed blaze orange something for November. And then, you know, I guess some cotton real tree coveralls from Canadian tire for bow season. And, uh, I'll figure out the layers underneath and if I'm cold. I'm cold. And if I'm not, I'm not, you know, and it's <laughs> now, now there's just so much, there's so much information, obviously, yeah. but there's also so many options to sift through. Right. And, and look, you know, yeah. I, I, on our end, we, we got to, you know, take some responsibility for, you know, uh, comparing this versus that and this gear and that gear and synthetic versus Merino and, you know, this backpack or that backpack. And, you know, we know people love that stuff and it's, even if it's just at a general interest to consume it, that's cool. But I think there's a, there's a strong point to be made for not overthinking it and rolling with what you got. And if you got a gap, you'll guess what, you'll figure it out when you're out there and then you can buy it when you come home. I just wrote an article for, um, in the Alberta Bow Hunters uh, Association, they came out with a magazine, and it was kind of just like the the new because I get messages, and I'm not even kidding. I get multiple messages every single day of guys, new trad guys, setting up their bows. So I started putting out just like little. I put out this article, just the nitty gritty of bow tuning, like the basics that you need. I think that you need to mm-hmm. do, and it's pretty well received. And and I think that's a big thing for a lot of guys because they're looking for info and then they dive into like some high end bow tuning stuff. And, and then you just go down a rabbit hole and I like, there's a lot of, there's oh, almost yeah. too much in, info and there's all also a lot of really bad info <laughs> floating around. So yeah, I think, I mm-hmm. think that um, it's hard. It's, it's a, it's a weird space that guys, guys kind of they're trying to learn but sometimes i think they're learning the the technical stuff way faster than they should be like they should be yeah crawling before they're walking walking before they're running you know yeah i was just i'll put a cliff note on that too i've had to stop quite a few guys recently when they start diving down the technical rabbit hole and they're like oh i just can't get this thing to shoot a bullet hole and it's like well it's because you can't get it to shoot a bullet bullet hole the bow is fine like you're not there yet um Mm -hmm. that that's just my quick sidebar to that man you're totally right um moving us in a little bit of a different go ahead i just uh i think too like i was thinking about this last night a lot of guys they'll just never be able to like when they're tuning their bow, they're never going to be able to have good enough shot to tune out what it's supposed to be. But if they could get it tuned good enough with their shitty shot <laughs> or their shitty release, <laughs> I, I think like as long as it's tuned to you as an individual, I think that's, that, yeah, yeah. that'll, that's good enough for some guys, you know? Yeah. yeah and I, I think if I could just jump in on this tie yeah, for please. a sec. <clears throat> and and this is coming from not a finger wagging perspective. This is from learning 
you know, after the fact or in hindsight that I'd put too much time into the wrong things, mm-hmm. right? Like it's that this is a point of diminishing returns on everything, right? There's a point where, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's use packs as an example, right? I could use a lighter pack than a mystery ranch pack. I hate packs that have no pockets, like mm-hmm. no organization whatsoever, right? So I can get something lighter and I had to use one of those to, you know, absolutely lose my mind on the top of the mountain as I'm doing the dig to the bottom to find one tiny little, you know, dry bag that I put something in because there were no, there were no actual pockets on that. It was just a barrel, right? With a top lid. Um, and, but I was like, Oh, I need the lighter pack and whatever. And then, you know, as things happen over a hunt, you're digging through your pack, all the little things end up at the bottom. And this is a really simple, maybe even silly example, but like I learned from that, that no, I need, I don't need to save an extra pound on my pack. I prefer to have organization that I can get whatever I want from whenever I want. And then there's too much organization, right? Mm -hmm. I won't name names, but there's some packs out there that have like 3000 pockets and that's just annoying too. Right. And, you know, coming back to tuning or shooting, like there's a point where, you know, yeah, like I get it. If you just want to like do something that keeps you kind of like in the game, right? Well, that's actually just, online research and reading stuff to, you know, stay interested or it's, you know, tinkering with your gear. I get it. But there's a point where that isn't going to pay off as much as you might think it will. Right. Exactly. Like, like you were saying, like get, get exactly, better at yeah. your form. Yeah. Your form or whatever. Don't obsess over the tuning, you know, go, you know, shoot at a yard in your basement and just dial in that that form instead, you know? Um, and there's just, you know, hundreds of examples in that space where, you know, you just don't need to spend any more time on those things. And then you can put that time into something else, maybe something where you are, but you do have shortfalls, you know? hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yep. So one of the, uh, I got into the, the journal of mountain hunting podcast pretty late into the game. Um, and it was actually Ronnie that sent me it. Ronnie was like, check these guys out. You like them. I was like, right on. Okay, cool. And I I happened to be leaving my house on a work trip that morning. So I like power downloaded like a million of them. And the first one I listened to was the interview. One one of the interviews that you guys did with Bill Jacks. Um, Mm. and I was just like blown away. I was like, these guys are from BC. They're independent dudes and they're having these like uh, meaningful conversations that are interesting. They're about hunting. They're about wildlife management. They're about conservation. And it's not like it's just a lot of that stuff can be just so boring and so dry and it's just so monotonous to get through. Right. But you want to listen to it still. Mm hmm. But uh, the way that you guys handled it, I was like, man, these guys are just like, these guys are nailing it. And it just totally inspired me. And it was just like, I, I was so pumped by it, by, by how you guys are, um, you know, uh, making, making that conservation topic palatable. Right. And, and it was like one of those things. It's like, if you go download a history podcast, like 99% of them are like the most annoying things ever, but there's like, you know, the one, the one out of a million podcast out there like you know a dan carlin hardcore history Mm -hmm. where you're Mm -hmm. like 17 hours into one episode you're like this is the best and i think (laughs) i think you guys do a really great job taking topics that could otherwise be really difficult to uh to have maybe a casual kind of person that's inside whatever space you guys are talking about and make it really palatable. And it, it, that was, that was one of the things that when we started, this really inspired me. I was like, I gotta figure out what the secret sauce is to, uh, to make this stuff interesting for folks. That way we can actually talk about some stuff that really matters, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm massively appreciated, man. And you know, a lot of that stuff in the last geez, probably almost two years, you know, I got to give full credit to Nolan for, for taking the lead on a lot of those conversations. And I think, I don't know, you know, I'm, you're kind of put, putting me on the spot as far as <laughs> the the so-called, you know, whatever secrets to doing that. And, and I honestly think it just comes back to the beginning of, you know, most of the time we're scratching our own itch. Mm-hmm. Like it's something that we're, you know, whoever's doing the podcast or the, or the article we're interested in we can't find a great answer to a a given question or we know it's a, it's a subject matter that, 
you know, needs to be brought forward. Cause you're right. Like going to like the, you know, ministry of the environment website to dig through a PDF of blah, 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 blah. Oh, like, yeah. No, like, I mean, I've done it. I'll, I'll do it again, but man, oh man, that's, uh, that's uh, some dry reading, right? So if you can find somebody like Bill Jax, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. you know, for those listening, a bio, um, based here in BC. Awesome. Um, dude. Awesome dude. Absolutely. Awesome dude. So knowledgeable. So, so good at not just his job, but this part of it, right. Is okay. Now taking that information that he knows, you know, not everyone's going to be able to really focus on, like, it's easy to kind of like tune, tune out the bulk of it, mm -hmm. but he can, you know, distill it in a way that, um, keeps you interested or, or put it in terms that get you interested. Um, and you know, and, and, and so we just try to, you know, we don't, as much as we were talking about overthinking like gear and packing pack lists and hunts and that sort of stuff, we try not to overthink the content. It's just, yeah. are we interested? Is this person, you know, I think Wacey, you were saying like, is this person going to be, um, a good con are they, are, can we have a good conversation with this person? Um, and then let's, let's go for it. Right. And mm -hmm. maybe once in a while, I'm trying to think if I've, I've probably been maybe three podcasts and we're almost at 300 now. Um, and, uh, some of that was technical issues and some of it was just like, you know, one was, I just shit the bed, like straight up <laughs> shit the bed. I wasn't prepped, I was, you know, just off that day. Didn't have enough coffee. Didn't have enough whiskey. I'm not sure which one, but, um, you know, I just, I just was, it was, it was a shit interview from on my part. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's, you know, maybe, a, maybe it's not three, maybe a, a couple more where it just wasn't very engaging content and we don't, we don't roll it. If, if that's the case. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's no, you know, special, you know, uh, I don't know, formula to it. It's just like, if we're interested, then, and sometimes we're probably wrong, but we just assume that there's probably other people interested. And yeah. then how do we, how do we make sure that content is interesting? And that's usually by defining somebody that knows what they're talking about and, and can share it in a way that, um, keeps people listening, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, for, for, for me coming into this space as an adult, like when I was in my twenties, I often, I often kind of pose a question to guests on this show by explaining, you know, when I was in my early or my mid twenties getting into hunting and I was like, just had this thirst for information much like you did when, when you were starting the journal. Um, but for all things and, and for, for, uh, being able to answer some of the hard questions. Cause one of the first things you're faced with as a hunter that starts hunting later in life and all of your friends and family and stuff around you are probably non hunters or, or, or maybe they have very little exposure to it. You know, they ask you, why do you want to do that? And it's like, uh, to answer that question honestly and, uh, give a good answer it's hard, you know, it's like you, you, me and you had this Whoa. conversation on the phone the other day, right? Yankee. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we were talking about, uh, you know, the honesty behind it and you can use meat as an answer that's widely accepted. And then, you know, the other parts of it, that's where people start to stumble, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I guess where I'm going with this is like, uh, I think it's really important to have these conversations and have them and, 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 and do it in an engaging way that keeps people on board. And you guys are, you guys are really doing a good job of that. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why the other day I, I called you to prep for an interview that I had just done. And, uh, um, I was like, Hey, I need to pick your brain. And you're like, let's go. And it was like, I don't know, probably two hour conversation <laughs> twice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. We see you were going to say something there, I think. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, when people ask, I've never like growing up, no, no one ever asked why I, we hunt. Like it was never, that was never a question. That's a new question, but I was just going to mm -hmm. say to Ty, I just tell people I like, I like guns and I like eating things. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's a new, it's a new question. I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's a weird space. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, I really go back to a memory of, of when I, when I first got into hunting, my mom was like, Oh, why do you want to shoot a deer so bad? Like she just didn't, she like, it, it wasn't in her, it wasn't in her scope. She didn't understand. And I was like, uh, 
you know, I'm going to eat it. And she was like, why? <laughs> like, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, uh, yeah. how do I explain this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, like, and it's, it's just like a space I grew up in. I remember, you know, we, if my dad would be butchering a moose, you know, in the yard, my grandma would come out of the house with a knife, walk over, cut the heart out you know, out of the gut pile and walk back in the house and cook it. Like, no, where I come from, nobody ever asked, right? It was just like, what's what we did. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. I do get that question sometimes now because, mm-hmm. you know, out of my immediate family, nobody hunts anymore, you know, and um, I'm the only one. So it's kind of weird, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, um, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with seeing that, uh, you know, it, it, that it's a new question. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and, you know, I think maybe, Wace, you and I, like where I grew up would be, uh, I, I would assume quite similar to where you grew up and probably still, uh, still live as far as, you know, that proximity to and exposure to, like you just described, right? Like that moose hanging in mm-hmm. the shed, the barn, the whatever. And that's, that's just a normal thing. Like oh, oh, as an example, <clears throat> I sent my, um, uh, some of my, uh, what my one cousin was my n- number one hunting mentor, his, his dad, my uncle, obviously, um, to a certain extent and all my uncles on my, on my mom's side of the family were mentors to me when it came, came to the outdoors and, and my dad as well. My dad didn't hunt. He's a absolutely crazy obsessed fisherman, um, but never got the, the hunting bug. But so they all, you know, were, were part of my hunting upbringing, but my older cousin was the one I hunted the most with. And so I was sending them some photos, you know, probably a year ago now. And, and they've got, uh, three kids in, in varying ages, not too young, but you know, I think the oldest is maybe like 15, something like that. And so this is going back, you know, at least a year, maybe even two years. I, I honestly can't remember. And I just said, Oh, by the way, there's, you know, a couple of pictures in there that, you know, you may, not want to show the kids. It was actually his, his, his wife that responded. She's like, uh, well, they were butchering a moose last week. So I'm pretty sure they're going to be okay with these you know, <laughs> breaking down an elk photos, you know? Um, and it's just to that point, right? We see of like, if you just grow up around it, you don't know anything but mm-hmm. hunting, um, or that that's part of life at least, right. That, you know, food doesn't only come from the grocery store and, you know, sometimes, you know, wolves and coyotes, you know, dead half frozen ones are going to be in the yard somewhere. And that's just, that's just the way it is. Um, (laughs) so it's, you know, I, I think when I say it is a new question or I agree with you about it being a new question. Um, and I do think that's the case, but I also think, you know, those of us that come from a more rural upbringing had a very different upbringing than those that, that didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously a, nowadays, a a question that's full of all sorts of <laughs> stuff. Right? I've had, I got some stories too, you know, like, uh, w- when you're, when you're, uh, you know, a, f- a fur taker, you're, t- when you kill a, in the wintertime, you know, if you snare a trap or shoot a coyote or a wolf, you, I don't like laying them on the ground cause then their, their fur freezes in. So when you go to you go to pry them up off the ground, you lose a little bit of fur, right? So to avoid fur damage, mm-hmm. you always hang them, hang them by their back feet. So they freeze nice. And then when you get time, you can go and skin them. And I remember, uh, me and me and, uh, Tyler's mutual friend there, my cousin, he come in his yard with his, with his wife at the time. And we had a half a dozen wolves hanging and, you know, maybe 20 or 30 coyotes. I was way behind <laughs> on skinning that year. <laughs> And she was, she's for, she was straight from the city and, um, she had never seen anything like that in her entire life. And she spent uh, probably about 30 minutes talking to me about, about like, so it was kind of weird. I thought, you know, it was going to, you know, looking back, maybe, you know, that's not the best way to do that is to hang stuff, but she was genuinely interested in, you know, why and everything. So it's kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a weird space with people nowadays because like, what's normal to us isn't normal to everybody. Right. So. Yeah. And it's, and it's a sad, well, maybe that's not the way, the way to put it. It's unfortunate, I guess the only way I can put it because, you know, Ty, when you, when you brought up that question, you know, the way I want to answer that is because I'm a hunter and guess what? At some point in your bloodline, 
you were too. But that doesn't really land very well. You know, you know it comes across a little um, high and mighty. But you know, honestly, that's that is it. Like I'm I'm a hunter, and you know, Ty, as you and I have talked about, mm-hmm. you know, there's certain things where, yeah, maybe you could say I'm hunting for meat. There's other things when I'm certainly not out there for meat. Um, that's a nice, you know, byproduct, but it's not why I'm there or, you know, in, out in the mountains of bloody Tajikistan. Yeah. I wasn't there to, to bring home a backstrap. I couldn't, you know? And so, um, as much as I think the simple answer for a lot of us, no matter how, you know, where you came from or how you got, how, how you were brought up is that it's just in you. And, mm-hmm. um, you may not know it. You may not feel it. You might be even really uncomfortable with the thought of it. And I'm not saying everyone needs to do it. I don't want everyone to do it because, uh, yeah, there's enough people out there already, but, um, I do take issue with it being this thing that's perceived to be bad or, or negative or whatever. And there's, you know, there's elements to the community that, you know, doesn't, doesn't help our cause. Um, but still like, you know, it's, it wasn't that long ago when it was a pretty normal occurrence for a deer or a moose or whatever to be hanging in, you know, your neighbor's yard or, you know, the barn, the shed, the whatever. And, um, you know, it's not happening as much anymore. And, um, it's, uh, so, you know, these questions come up and yeah, we're, we're in a, we're in an interesting time in terms of people's connection to, um, you know, any part of that, whether it's where their food comes from or, you know, what it's like to hunt, you know, like I've heard Renella talk about this or maybe it was it Renella or uh, Randy Newberg, one of those two, like, or actually it was Renella. He was talking about driving across a, you know, a bridge in some, you know, small town. And I can't remember where it was, maybe the Midwest. And he used the example of, of when he grew up trapping muskrat. And so he drives across this bridge and he's like, I drive across that bridge and I see like, you know, whatever, 20 different things that I'm thinking about in terms of, could I trap a muskrat here? Where would I set the trap? You know, blah, blah, blah. All those variables that we as, you know, hunters or other takers of, of game, you know, have to learn to understand. So when we look at a, a hillside, a mountainside, a valley, um, a, a creek, a stream, whatever, we, we just see it different. Right. Um, and I think Newberg says something very similar to like, you know, the average person hiking around to look at the wildflowers, nothing, nothing against it. It doesn't give a shit when the wind hits them in the back of the neck. But as a hunter, you have this like moment of panic, panic. You're like, shit, I got to move. I got to get out of the position or I'm out. Damn it. I'm busted. Like we just have this different, I, I always use the term connection. It's not maybe my favorite way to put it, but, um, there's, there's a lot more to it than just the meat. Um, and, you know, this comes back to what you, you and I, Ty, have been talking about a fair bit over the past couple of weeks is that's part of it sometimes. Sure. Shit isn't all of it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think adventure. that's an interesting. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, um, we talk, we talk about it kind of at length on here with, with different folks about, you know, the reasons why we hunt and, and how do we answer that and how do we convey that to the non hunting public in a way that is, um, helping our cause instead of hurting it. Right. That's sort of one of the cruxes of the conversation in, in 2021 is, you know, how, how do we, how do we share what we're doing in a way that's not, um, damaging. Right. And part of that, I think, is is still being honest, you know, for me, like, um, am I going to go on a mountain goat hunt, kill a mountain goat? And and am I going to be pumped about the meat? Yeah, sure. Is it why I'm going? I mean, to be completely honest, no. Like, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's, there's better animals to eat. I'm sure. Like if I was really concerned about, about the meat, I'd go shoot a couple of young whitetails every year and that would probably be it and go kill an elk, you know, um, the freezer's full for the year then. Um, and I think there's just the component of being honest too, right? Like, um, 
and 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 the other the other kind of angle of it is the the not the rationalization but the explanation in the sense that um having the ammo that you need to have that conversation and talk about the um like the biology side of it the biological angle of you know this is what we're doing this is why these animals need to be har- harvested killed you know harvested but uh and, and like when i had um lord balix on i was like hey this is a question that i often answer how would you answer it as a non-hunting biologist like and she said well like i think i think i can't remember her exact wording but she basically said like hunters are a useful ter- a tool for biologists to use to manage a population of animals and not only that you guys basically fund uh, all of the animal research right um mm-hmm. i just think it's really important to, to kind of combine all of those topics into one conversation so people can get an idea because like you know yonke from living in vancouver when you live down there when you have those conversations, you're starting off as not having home field advantage, and and mm-hmm. you, and you're and you're you're working backwards quite quite. Or I don't know if you're working backwards, but you're you're working from a a, a disadvantage right out of the gate. Um, and you really have to explain to folks like, hey, this this is you know this is why we do this stuff. And then usually by the end of that conversation, the person's pretty cool with it. They're pretty excited to hear about your adventure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I think the, um, the issue with how, and I'll, I'll make this, you know, about us or our community. Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and, you know, if we get to, the BS outside our community. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but uh, I've got lots of hot air on that one too. But you know, in terms of like within our community, and this comes back to this whole idea of a meat, I'm a meat hunter. I'm a whatever hunter, like these labels, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're doing a disservice by simplifying it that much. And I I know some people disagree with me on this or like, you know, Yankee shut the, you know, whatever up about, Oh, it's so complex and deep and whatever. And if you don't agree with that, that's, that's cool. But um, it is complex. Like whether you agree with it or not, I don't care. It's a very complex subject now. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't, but now it is. Um, and by trying to simplify this into like, well, I'm a, I just hunt for meat. Well, you know, I get it. People can, most people can understand that and grasp it. And, you know, I think more and more people come to appreciate the fact that that meat is something you went and got yourself and it's, you know, clean and as organic as you're going to find and blah, 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 all the buzzwords we can throw at it. Yeah. Um, but it it just isn't that simple anymore. Right. Like when it comes to, you know, using the example of Laura and wildlife management, like there's a lot of people that disagree with the need to manage wildlife, let nature run its course. Mm -hmm. Well, Last time I checked, humans have had some form of an impact on the environments that, you know, <laughs> we, we yeah. find ourselves in. Yep. And guess what? We're part of nature. Yep. That's you, what I was going to say. That's what, that's what yeah. I wanted to say. Because, like, a lo- um, we're part of the equation. And we have been for thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> so, yes. you know. So, yeah. I mean, th- we have to understand that, you know, we uh, have an impact on these habitats. There's no if ands or buts about it. There's not a day that goes by that I don't see a mule deer walk down the street in front of my house as though it's going to the bus stop, you know, to join the other kids hopping on the school bus. Um, and people come and they complain about, oh, they're eating my this and that in my backyard. Yeah, because we're in their fucking wintering ground. We're in their space where we live. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you got a problem with them eating your begonias or whatever stupid flowers you have in your backyard. Like, let's think about what's going now I'm talking external and I'm getting a bit ranty here. So I apologize, but I think, I think our responsibility as hunters is to like, we got to find an an entry point to the conversation or to help them, you know, even want to hear about the experience. Like you were saying, Ty, like a lot of people, once they get into it are, are quite interested. My wife used to hate this in Vancouver. I'd come back from a hunt and one of my favorite things to do is share that meat with friends and family, Mm -hmm. you know, like you and I talked about this tie, like to me, sometimes that's as much a trophy as the, the elk rack and the moose rack and the 
Ibex rack and the goat head that's in my house, you know? Um, but when we bring, or when we would bring over, you know, our, our, our Vancouverite friends and many of them weren't hunters, inevitably the dinner conversation would be utterly dominated by hunting. Oh, and yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't push it. I wouldn't force it. I'd even try to like, cause I'd see my wife just kind of start to roll her eyes. <laughs> I'd even start to like steer us away from it. And, but it just always came back. Like, so what do you do when you, when you get one on the ground? Well then, then, you know, that's a reasonably long description. Um, and like you were saying, Ty, like people are just like, wow, like that's really interesting. And there was never any like, Oh, I, you know, maybe it's cause they were our friends, but no one was ever like, I, I could never do it. I don't get it or whatever. Like there was always interest. Mm -hmm. Um, so we got to find that entry point, but then we got to be able to explain it more simply than, yeah, I'm out there for a hind roast. Fuck off. Sorry for the language. <laughs> you guys don't swear like that on, on your podcast yeah, okay. as much it's as I, I, I think I already swear too. We're good. Okay, oh good. yeah. I swear, um, fuck, I swear the fuck out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do AC, but I, uh, I, I want, want to be respectful of the fact this isn't my show, so I shouldn't, uh, that's, use that's language. That's okay. Oh, no. Rick, we'll put the, ex, we'll put the explicit thing on there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, it's just, you know, yeah, there we go. Um, we just, yeah, we just got to put more effort into it really, you know, whether it's habitat, whether it's conservation and like, like population conservation, which of course is linked to habitat, but habitat protection, the impacts of habitat, um, and all the way to the, you know, the, the less, uh, easy to put your finger on finger on why. And I guess I would, I would honestly encourage more people in our community to, like you said this Ty, right? Just be honest with your why. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them it's about meat because you think that's what they want to hear. I don't care if that's on social media or in, you know, an interaction that'll never show up on any form of media. Just, you know, if it's about adventure, like it is for a lot of my hunts and you were saying the same, I think, Wacy for the goat hunt, mm -hmm. then talk about that. That doesn't mean the meat's not important that you're not going to do all the right things with the meat, but explain the adventure of it. Like one of the things we see in the journal audience and I love this part of our, of our audience is we get a lot of, a lot of late or adult onset hunters that come from other, you know, quote unquote, extreme sport backgrounds. And they're like, wait, I can combine some of my skills, like your buddy that's coming on the goat hunt. Mm -hmm. Some of my, my skills from skiing, climbing, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I can get out there and see, you know, terrain or country. I'd, probably never put myself in because there isn't a mountain bike trail or a climbing route there or something like that. And I might be able to come home and, you know, put something in the freezer that I get to enjoy. Like, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's a huge part of this, right? Is, is the, I mean, let's put it even more simply fun. Guess what? It's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at Wordo too. That's a great example of a dude coming from a different space. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what, uh, another component too, is when you start having these conversations with, um, folks that don't hunt and you start going, Oh yeah, I've been, you know, working towards this trip for oh, a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've been practicing shooting my bow for oh a decade. I've been, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've been researching this area for a couple of years. I've been spending my spare time calling people that I know have been in the area. I'm doing all this stuff. And like, it, 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 once people start to realize too, that this isn't just, uh, you hop in your Chevy Silverado, drive down the forestry service road and shoot your AR-15 at the window at, a, at the first doe that you see they start to realize the picture is a lot different than Elmer Fudd, you know? Yeah. Are you, are you, uh, are you 100% sure it's a Chevy Silverado and not a Ram 1500? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> it's, I, I, when I said AR-15, I, I, I was laughing too. I was just kind of poking fun at uh, how stupid people are. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just bugging you. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it, but it's true, right? Like, you know, it's called hunting, not killing. Yeah. We, we, we don't, we don't get something every time. I mean, Wacy does, I know, but yes, 
<laughs> if you could only see the background not highlight reel, it's painful. <laughs> yeah, right. But that but that's you know, that that's that's the thing, right? It's I mean, you use a I think a perfect example, Ty, of like this this idea of rolling around the back roads or whatever and shooting the you know, if it's if it's brown, it's down, first thing that moves. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and sure there's there's people that hunt that way. Yeah, it exists let's, for let's, sure. Let's, exists. let's not let, let, let's not mask it, right? Yeah. Um, but they also don't always get something, and uh, the same same for the rest of us. And it's um, there's you know if it was just if it was just about the meat, I said this to you in one of our phone calls, Ty. Right? Like, yep. don't don't tell me you need it. Don't unless you live in a in such a remote area where it is that that, that you do that that is a a more economical way for you to put meat on your table. Don't tell me you need it. That's just not true. Yeah. You want it, you prefer it, but you don't need it. I can promise you it is cheaper to go and buy the most expensive ribeye you can find at the grocery store than it is to get a chunk of meat that good out of the, the back country. I can promise you. And so it's, you know, this idea of it being this, this need and it's about the meat, like it's, it's, that's not fair. It's not fair to the pursuit. It's not fair to our community mm-hmm. to make it that simple. Again, that's not, I'm not saying the meat isn't important for a lot of people and it's a starting point for a lot of people. And that's a great starting point, but I haven't met anybody anybody that's come to hunting later in life that maybe and Wardo Wardo started for the meat. Mm-hmm. All he wanted was the meat. And now, you know, in less than five days we leave for a backpack, backpack sheep hunt. Giddy up. That's not, that's not for the meat. You know, mm-hmm. do I want stone sheep meat? You better believe it. Have I been told it's the best meat I'm, I'm, I'm ever going to have? You better believe it. It's a, uh, but like you said, I think it's just a, uh, it's been just dumbed down to just give one simple response. And so you don't have to deal with it anymore. Right. Like you just, yeah, I hunt for meat. And then next topic, you know, like, mm-hmm. and I don't, and it's not doing us any justice by saying that. Well, it's like, I mean, we can get into another rabbit hole here. The, uh, the word trophy, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, um, it, it's just been so weaponized. It, it's, it's gone. You know, we can't say mm-hmm. the word trophy. It's like, Oh, if you're a trophy hunter, you're, you're, you're the, that word, the, that word has been so beat up. Like, um, the, so in Alberta, you know, you, when you apply for your antelope draw, you know, you got non-trophy antelope when you get a trophy antelope and, I've, I sat in on meetings that they want to like <clears throat> within Alberta and they want to try and remove the name, the word out of a trophy. Like don't even have it in there. Like just get rid of it. That's how, <laughs> well, that's how, that's how far that um, word has been weaponized or whatever you want to say. They just, nobody wants to touch it anymore. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I wouldn't call this a rabbit hole. I would call this a meteor crater. Uh, <laughs> it's the, it's um, a hole that falls all the way to the depths of yeah, hell. It's, it, this, we, will, we may be speaking Chinese by the time we're done with this one. We'll be on the other side of the earth. Um, but, uh, you know, the this is an interesting one, right? Because I can see the, um, you know, the desire to stop using that word because it has been weaponized. It's been turned against us. Um, and anywhere it can be found or seen, it's, it's like confirmation of the fact that we're these mass murderers, basically in the eyes of those that don't like the idea of, of trophies. Right. Um, yeah. And there's, and there's a lot to, you know, unpack there, but uh, yeah, a few years back, cause this is, I mean, when, when I had you guys on our show, we talked about the grizzly bear hunt here in BC. Yeah. And, um, when that was all going down and lead up to it, I was doing a lot of, a lot of research. And again, this is for my, for myself. I didn't want to hunt grizzly bears. And I should actually clarify this point when I talk about, you know, meat and being more, um, willing to go beyond that. Cause that used to be something I thought and felt I didn't want to hunt black bears because I didn't think I wanted to eat the meat. I'd read too many stupid forum posts saying you can't eat black bear meat. Well, that's dead wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and now I love hunting black bears and I had the same mindset on, on, 
you know, the grizzly bear hunt. I had been, you know, led to believe or was under the impression that they were inedible. And I, I had nothing against it. It just wasn't something I wanted to do. That perspective has changed for me drastically as I've spent more time in, in this space. But, um, you know, the while I was kind of trying to figure that part out, right? Like, how do I think and feel about this whole grizzly bear hunt thing? And, and as I kind of touched on there, like that, that changed drastically as I got deeper and deeper into the space. But we're coming across this really interesting article. I can't remember what it was in. It was like a scientific American or like a nature magazine that I just happened to glance at on um, uh, BC ferries sailing one day. And the, I don't remember the headline, but it caught my eye. I dig into the article and it was sharing how going back thousands of years, thousands of years, um, you know, primitive peoples were keeping mementos, AKA trophies. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, whether you like it or not, whether we like the term or not, this isn't a new thing. You know, like people go and they collect rocks People go and collect, you know, all sorts of different things. And just because a hunter, you know, quote unquote, takes a life versus picking a rock up off the ground, that's, you know, whatever looks like something cool and different. Um, it's not that different. Yes, we can disagree on whether taking a life is valid or not, but, you know, we're all taking life every single damn day, whether we're, we're our hands are, are bloody or not, mm -hmm. it's happening. So, and I'm, and this is to, you know, the non-hunting community more than the hunting community. Like, you know, that, that iPhone that you like to, you know, virtue signal on all day, every day, I guarantee you it's take, there's lives being taken in the animal kingdom for that thing to end up in your hand. And oh, by the way, you replace it every year with a new one. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, this, this idea of like trophies or mementos being some, well, one unique to the hunting realm. I mean, people that fish, why can a f fucking 30 pound pike hang on a wall and not get judged any different than that whitetail rack yeah. on the wall? You know, mm -hmm. there's like, where's the, where's the difference? The difference is a fish isn't cute and cuddly. Yeah. That's the difference. You know, a really interesting thing that, um, I stumbled into with Wacy, um, because like I said, I started hunting as an adult and I obviously don't have a background in, in trapping, although I've been waiting to do my trapping course with the stupid COVID thing. Um, anyways, a uh, thing I ran into with Wacy was, hey, Wacy, what do you do with all your uh, coyote fur? And it, I mean, come straight to Vancouver, get sent overseas or whatever, and they trim out all the, them canada goose jackets with it and mm -hmm. those are the same folks downtown that have an issue with quote unquote trophy hunting like what do you want to do you want to know the number one purchaser of canada goose jackets in the world <laughs> new york city mm -hmm. every coyote we we take and and oh, i'm not gonna lie i shoot bears and i shoot coyotes for predator management because i want more ungulates mm -hmm. on the land like i don't lie to people about that that's what i do it for and i love doing it too and it gets me outside but that's the main reason and and so when people say oh you know you know why do you do this and i'm like well everybody in new york needs a winter coat so <laughs> <laughs> and a whole bunch of people in vancouver at 10 degrees celsius are wearing a canada goose coat that's not what it's for people <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, no, and like Rick, um, Rick Elder, who, um, um, now former CEO of beyond clothing, he talked about this on one of our podcasts, right? Like they tried to look at an alternative to natural coyote roughs on their jackets. And guess what? It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to use that natural fiber. Otherwise it freezes or it loses function. Um, and, and yeah, people, people obviously buy that stuff. No, no problem. But you know, like the, the whole, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I want to say stupidity. That's probably not fair, but the lack of, you know, thought around people's opinions on a given thing and then their own behaviors and how those things may be a lot more similar than they think is, you know, something that's going to take a, pile of work to solve. And I don't know, maybe it's not even solvable, right? But to me, this comes back to 
our willingness um, as a hunting community to um, to put time in those conversations. Yeah. And or if you're, you know, a hunter that's newer to the community, and you're like, oh, I hunt for meat and I don't want to hunt bears. And, you know, we saw this again. I, I hate to bring up the grizzly bear hunt again. We saw this with the grizzly bear hunting ban. Mm-hmm. There were just as many people against it in the, maybe not just to me, but there was a lot of people against in the hunting community, um, that, that didn't, you know, take any action. They didn't get behind trying to stop that closure from happening. Yeah. Um, because they like, Oh, I don't really care about, you know, the trophy grizzly bear hunt. Well, look where, look where we're at now, folks. Yeah. No Mm -hmm. kidding. You know, well, I I mean, even I've had people say, I've had people say to me, you know, um, what did they what did they ever do to you like about me uh taking coyotes and wolves and it's like it's they it's almost like they think i got this personal vendetta yeah, <laughs> like an agenda that i i'm just pissed off and i want to kill everything you know, i like You're wolves on the, i like wolves out there i like hearing them how mm-hmm. i like seeing them i don't want to kill everyone but there is a fine line when you're out moose hunting and all you see is wolf tracks and bear tracks i mean there's mm-hmm. just and no, and no moose calf survival rate. Like, like you going back to you, what you said earlier, Yonke, we are part of the equation. We have been forever and people just now think that we don't have to be anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I think a, a reasonable, and again, this is, I'm not saying we should be combative with people cause that doesn't get us anywhere, but you know, when it, when it comes to wolves or coyotes, what did they do to you? Well, what did that dandelion do to your garden? Didn't do anything, but you picked it. Mm-hmm. Why? Because you don't want those dandelions to spread in your garden or whatever, pick, pick your, your weed. Um, because you have an idea for what that, you know, little tiny chunk of landscape should look like. And you don't want these things to overtake your garden or whatever it is. So you pick them. Well, you know what? It's not that different. Mm -hmm. You may not like it, but it's not that different. Because if we don't do some of the things that might make others uncomfortable, we, there, there's a, there's a ripple effect, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, like, and I say this to a lot of people that like, uh, come to you, not you, I don't want to say use it, but I try to find a way to bring this up. And people are like, ask me about black bears. Oh, can you eat it? Blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I make an effort to share black bear meat with as many people as I can. And <clears throat> I haven't had a single person, maybe they're being polite, but I can usually tell if a person's choking something down and not liking it. Um, most people really like it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then, oh, by the way, did you know that black bears are one of the number one predators of, of fawns and elk calves mm-hmm. and moose calves, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and, and so do you like that? Those animals? Well, there's, there's some so-called dirty work that needs to be done to balance and, or I don't even know if balance is possible, so I shouldn't use that word, but to do our part, to try to manage the situation. And again, manage is, I mean, for goodness sakes, manage is a loaded term now. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. People that don't, that don't like that idea. Um, but we just, we got to put more effort into those, um, those topics, right? We can't just simplify it. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't help us. Yeah. Another interesting kind of point or angle on this is when, when, you know, people (laughs) say trophy hunting and you're hunting for horns and this kind of stuff. And it's like, man, I, I, I can't, I don't have it in me to, to, to leave, leave that in the field or not put that up in my house and not, and not, you know, Mm -hmm. remember, remember the hunt and, you know, to mm-hmm. sound cliche to honor the animal or whatever with having that stuff. Like, I mean, I'm sitting at my desk right now. There's a freaking elk rack on my desk and you go into my living room, there's a bunch of mule deer heads, you know, like that's, that's, I mean, it, it's, I don't have it in me to leave that stuff in the field or, or, or not not look at it every day. And then the other component of it too is, you know, people talk about, Oh, well, you're just trying to shoot the biggest animal you can. Well, of course I'm trying to shoot the biggest animal I can. That's the hardest thing to do. And that is what's best for the, uh, for the animals on the landscape too, to take, Mm -hmm. take the animals that have, um, spread their genes and done their thing. And, you know, it's funny, All, all of the, all of the points that people get really upset about, like the horns or shooting the most mature animal, it's all the points that the 
all the biologists that set out the regulation for us want us to do. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if you if you go in for your uh, your inspection of your 13 year old sheep, the, the biologist is going to be really happy. If you show up with a seven year old sheep, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, um, the, I mean, just stand on the, the trophy, the horns, the whatever. I mean, this is another thing you and I talked about, Ty, right? Mm-hmm. Like we've got to separate the intention from the outcome, right? Like, if a guy wants to go, a guy or a gal wants to go and shoot a giraffe or an elephant or a guy like me wants to go to Tajikistan and shoot a nice old Ibex. Yeah. You may not agree with my why, but we've got to have a conversation about the outcome because that outcome in most cases is going to be positive either for that small, local, crazy backwater rural area especially for talking overseas um oftentimes for the funding mechanisms that keep those animals on the landscape and oftentimes for the populations right if you're selectively going after the oldest animal which oh by the way usually not always usually has at least in most truly natural environments i'm not talking you know um engineered environments and we won't get into that topic, but Mm. truly natural environments or mostly natural environments. Um, if you're going for the oldest animal, you're often going to get the one with the biggest horns, antlers, tusks, whatever it might be. Sometimes the biggest body size, not always. We know they start to decline after a certain point. Every species starts to deteriorate. Look at, you know, your grandparents, if you don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got to be able to look at that outcome. And we've got to be able to speak to that outcome as a hunting community, right? I don't have to agree. Like we'll use an example of, you know, the auction tags that are, they're sold at a cheap show every year. There's a lot of people in the hunting community that have a lot to say about, you know, some so-called rich, you know, dude that can drop 300 grand on X tag. And then the fact that they hire, you know, a small platoon of guides to go in the field, find them the ram that they want. That's often been pre-scouted and is part of why they're buying that tag that year. Cause they know there's a hammer in that unit that they're going to be able to put on their wall. Mm-hmm. Um, and they fly in on their private jet to the nearest airstrip, you know, get put on the ram and they pull the trigger on their long range rifle. And before you know it, they're back in the office, you know, 48 hours later, would I call that hunting? I don't know. It's not my preferred way to hunt, but if I had the means and the funds and the whatever, and I, it was the only way I could get out into sheep country, I might do it. Yeah. Um, but you may not like the way that hunt occurs, but you gotta be at least open to the fact that that money and the harvesting of that older age class Ram is helping that area. I'm not saying it's all good. Like this isn't black and white. But we've got to be able to look at those outcomes. I mean, I'll use Tajikistan again. I, I shared this with you, Ty. Right? When I went to um, TJ, I wasn't there for meat. I knew I wasn't going to be able to bring the meat home. But um, you better believe that every single morsel of that Ibex, to include its fucking intestines that I ate stuffed with chopped up meat into like a backcountry kielbasa, um, was consumed either by us in camp or shared with the village that was the closest village to where we left. Because guess what? They're not legally allowed to hunt Ibex. Do I agree with that? That I can fly in there as a great white hunter and hunt something they can't? <laughs> no, but I don't, I don't, I don't sit in the seat of that government. I don't make the rules. And at least they got to have some Ibex mm-hmm. and a whole like retinue of people got income for that trip. Like we had, probably a, a, you know, a, an entourage of like 12 different people helping us on that hunt, the camp cooks, different people driving us. Cause it took us like 40 hours to get from one side of Tajikistan to the other side of Tajikistan, three different vehicles that, um, we had to transfer our gear to, and then get through to the next checkpoint and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like there's, there were a lot of positive outcomes that came from that. Mm. And, you know, another thing, you know, within the same vein, people talk about, Oh yeah, photo safaris and grizzly bear viewing on the coast. Like, okay, cool. What about the inland grizzlies? Ain't nobody taking pictures of them. Who's funding those areas. Mm. 
right? And when hunters, I think by definition, when they go and and travel to hunt, usually find themselves in areas that the average casual Joe backcountry or Jane backcountry don't go into. They go to the documented trails to a set campsite and or cabin or hut or something like that. And they have their experience. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if hunters aren't willing to go to some of the crazy places we do, you know, funds won't end up in those communities. Populations won't get managed. And some people may think that's perfectly okay, but I can promise you it's not in most, in most areas, right? Like, you know, that elephant just absolutely destroying and usually to include the herd, um, a small, you know, deep in the wilderness African village is, you know, crops and whatever they have, which is usually pretty damn meager. Um, you know, it helps to sometimes take one of those elephants out of there. Um, and we could use a whole bunch of other examples as to how I think, um, you know, we gotta be able to talk about the outcomes from this, you know, highly negative thing that is trophy hunting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, I kind of get a kick out of um, when folks say to you, oh, you know, it's it's not so complicated. You're overcomplicating it, Adam. But yeah, it's true, man. It's uh, it's it's a a complicated issue, complicated issues, complicated conversations, and they're important to have. And I think um, having those conversations and telling our stories is is kind of the the path to making sure we can hunt and we can keep doing the stuff that we love. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm biased cause it's, uh, you know, obviously as I've shared here, that's my perspective on it. Mm-hmm. But I think, um, if we don't, uh, start putting more effort into, you know, learning about these things and then being able to talk about them instead of, you know, falling back on, oh yeah, I hunt for meat and yeah, I would never do what that asshole over there does. Well, I guess so. I guess that's one approach, but it's not helping us. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, Another conversation we had on the phone the other day was we were talking about um, kind of the optics of hunting in Africa and what it does for the communities there. And now this is a subject that I've not really dove into very much. Um, and uh, it, uh, honestly, it's not something that uh, is even on my radar. I actually just had another guy on the podcast, um, Kyle. Uh, I'm gonna mess, Kyle Southgate. He's he was um, mm-hmm. yeah he was a director at Wild Sheep Society here in BC. But guy's an absolute um, <clears throat> stud. But he's gone over there, and he was kind of like me. He had. <clears throat> excuse me he had no interest in going over there and no interest in hunting there and he ended up over there and it kind of changed his perspective and uh we had a good conversation about it but y- y- you have some some opinions and stuff on on what's what's going on over there in africa and and what what people over here are saying about it eh? i mean i, I i'm not you know like Robbie from blood or origins anywhere <laughs> remotely that, you know, uh, plugged into what's going on over there. And, and my opinions are, I, I don't know if general would be the way to put it. I've just spoken with enough people that have gone and paid enough attention to the goings on there as it relates to hunting and anti poaching efforts and, and all that stuff mm-hmm. to, I guess I, I guess I've got just enough information to be dangerous and, but more, specifically enough information to know that it's not something that we should automatically throw under the bus. Mm. Again, you don't have to like the fact that the person wants to shoot an animal that you don't think is worth shooting. Um, But I think as hunters, we should at least put some time into trying to understand how that might be okay too. Mm. Right. Like, I mean, coming back to intentions, if some, somebody tells me they're a meat hunter and also f- waves the, uh, I'm a diehard conservationist flag, then I got problems with your intentions because mm-hmm. those, the two, those two things don't add up. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, um, you know, when it comes to Africa, I, again, I'm not going to pretend to be able to speak to 
even, you know, some of the current events, I just know that, um, the, because it's obviously such a hot button topic. And if there's, you know, uh, you know, a social media post or a news article that's going to set the world aflame, it's often going to be African hunting. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, in, in obviously the context of, of hunting media. Um, and it's just not that it's just not as, uh, as simple as people make it out to be. I mean, I think I shared, shared this with you. In one of our conversations recently, there was, I can't remember who the dude was, but it was a post he put up on social media. And I want to say he was a hunter, but had something to do with national geographic. Um, I might've even been on the Nat Geo, uh, Instagram feed, which look, I'm not saying I think Nat Geo is the be all and end all. I just happened to come across it. It's going back a couple of years. Mm. And the first, it was like a, one of those like sliders on Instagram, right? It was like however many photos, a bunch of photos. And the first photo was a guy with the classic, you know, safari sticks and, uh, lining up a shot. Next photo was a dead elephant on the ground. And then the next series of photos was a progressively smaller and smaller and smaller pile of, <laughs> of what's left of the animal to be in the last photo, which was just a giant red patch in the grass. And the post was a long one. And it was basically saying like, it, it kind of what I'm saying right now, which is you may not like this, but this is what happens. And every single chunk of that elephant is used. Yeah, the dude probably took the tusks home and you, you may not like that. But the villagers that helped that happen have meat for a very long time from this. This was a celebration for that, for that village. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of things like that. I mean, we could bring up, <clears throat> pardon me, the big cats, you know, jaguars, et cetera. Yeah. And you know what that might be doing in, again, a small village, uh, or community situation in, in, in Africa, obviously. So, I mean, it's just, there's so much to it. And here's the good news. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to actually dig into this stuff beyond, you know, spending five seconds scrolling through Instagram or whatever to be like, yes, I agree. I don't agree. Well, <laughs> you know, cool. I've been guilty of that too. Many, 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 many times, mm -hmm. but you know, if we, if we care about hunting, then I, I think we just got to put a little bit more effort into understanding all these, all these elements. And yeah, it's easy also to say like, well, that's in Africa. It doesn't impact me. Yeah. I wish that was true, but you know, the things that happen in, in Africa are the things that, that, you know, feed the anti hunting, um, flames do impact us. It all gets lumped together now, yep. you know, in a lot of people's minds, killing a grizzly bear, as a trophy isn't all that different from killing a lion as a trophy. Yeah. You know, and we got to, if for nothing else, if we look at Africa to understand how we can address these things when they come to North America, because they are, Yep. if you try to tell me otherwise, you're wrong. They are happening here. Look at the act now campaign here in BC. Yeah. Um, so if, if no other reason we can learn from those situations that are, a lot more, you know, hot button so that when they happen here, we're better positioned to push back, fight back, take action and, and figure out ways to get there. Like, I'm not saying this is all about like, Oh, we got to fight back and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we do in certain respects, but how we do it is what's important. Um, and we got to get better at it, bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so heading back into our own backyard here a little bit, I have a couple mm -hmm. more questions for you mm -hmm. and, then, and then I'll let you get on with your day here. Um, sheep hunt, Adam Yonke, mm. you're going. Yes. Stone yes, sheep. Yes. Hopefully you get that one crossed off the list this year. Yeah. Let's hope. Let's, let's hope it's been uh, a long time, a long time coming. That's for sure. Um, I'm excited, man. Wardo and I moved our location from where he had initially intended to go. I wasn't a, I wasn't a shoe in to, to be able to go, but just given, um, some projects in the works this year, um, I'm, I'm finally going for my first opener. I've never gone out for the opener. I love the fall, like yeah. legit fall. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I, my, my hunting, not that my hunting brain ever turns off, but the idea of being out in quote unquote, summer. Yeah. Uh, although we, we know full well that August in the North uh, isn't always very summerish. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've never, never gone out for the opener. 
and um and Wardo and I leave in like I said a few days. That's awesome, man. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm super stoked, super stoked, and also doing a a first for me a a, a hike in off um, one of the highways. So cool. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm definitely definitely pumped, man. It's uh, the countdown is on. I can't wait to hear about it, man. That's exciting. We, we were chatting about the hunt that uh, you and Wardo were going on, and it was exciting because it was a archery hunt. But I think this would be uh, just as cool. And I can't, can't wait to hear about it. Oh man. I can't wait to, uh, well, you know, no matter the outcome, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, whether it's on our podcast or if you want me to come back on and talk about it on here, I'd be happy to, but I'm, I'm a big fan of regardless of the outcome, sharing, you know, lessons learned and mm-hmm. gear that worked and didn't work and, you know, things we could have done better. And usually some, some, as long as the water is there, some, some funny funny goings on that um, make those trips memorable no no matter what happens but you're not gonna uh, come on here and hit me with a a waste dog it was good everything was fine i didn't die (laughs) (laughs) no i don't think uh i I don't think that would be my my summary of it (laughs) no hey waste yeah pretty much that's <laughs> i sometimes i really lack in the art of uh, telling a story that's my biggest problem so that's usually my go-to yeah everything's good i'm good no <laughs> you, but wait, so you make up you make up for them the art of um impersonating dodge ram uh, voiceover uh, actors yeah <laughs> i know i know I know. <laughs> you know, Wacy does tell some some good stories. Well, well, one day uh, you'll have to share camp with them, Adam. So, oh, I'd love to. You know, yeah, my, you know what kind of my problem is with like the whole podcasting world thing is, I'm kind of rough around the edges. I swear and say really a lot. I swear a lot of th- I say a lot of <laughs> things that probably shouldn't be aired. You know, so when I'm telling I telling a story, it's kind of I like to just tell it in person. You know. <laughs> You just got you just got to let go of that uh that that worry, Wacy. That's uh you know, that's I think that's part of the secret sauce for you, man. And and you know what? Like we've talked about this a lot with our um you know, the crew of guys that we we bring into the fold to do our film content is um you know, it's kind of cliche, I guess, but just be real. Like, yeah, you know, our, one of our things with that beyond the kill series was, you know, making locker room talk great again. Like I think, I think there's a, a thirst for that. And yeah, I mean, there's some things that you probably want to keep in the circle of trust, but, um, at the same time, uh, I don't know, man, I wouldn't hold back. We yeah. I, I like listening to your stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're so fun. I'm working on it. I'm <laughs> new to the podcast world, but I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, so good. Um, so okay, let's 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 wrap this thing up with a serious one. Actually, mm. oh, oh, before we get there though, uh um you're you're gonna be an elk hunter this year, huh, Adam? Yeah, well I was I was gonna say we can't forget the um <laughs> we'll we'll use careful terminology, but the mentorship that you're gonna provide uh, I don't know, it's not this. it's not mentorship and it, the mentorship is coming from my buddy Hart. Well, it'll be a group effort, I'm sure. But yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped for that, for that trip, man. That's, that's part of the reason why I'm doing the August opener Mm -hmm. for sheep is we've got a project that, um, needs to include some elk content. And if you've watched, um, the beyond the kill elk series, you'll know that my, um, success with Rocky mountain elk is uh, informed entirely by luck and zero by skill. Um, and, uh, it's, it's not one of my fortes by any stretch. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you and I, and a few other guys are going to get out in the elk woods this, uh, this September. And I'm, I'm super pumped for that, man. Yeah. Super that'd be fun. I'm, lo- I'm looking, I'm looking to forward to sharing camp with you for a few days at least. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> It'd be cool. It'd be real fun. Okay. So let's, let's wrap this baby up with a serious one here. And I've been kind of asking guys that, asking guys and gals that have a lot to say this question at the tail ends of these things. And it kind of spirals wildly out of control. And we've probably touched on some of it already. Um, But I've kind of been asking people, you know, uh, given your position that you're somebody that cares about hunting and you care about the outdoors and you want to see all the different animals on the landscape and you're, you're doing your due diligence, even you're doing more than your due diligence, uh, Adam, by giving back to the community and being involved in 
conservation and all the other aspects of, of what we're doing here and, and what you're doing. Um, so all of that being said, the question is, um, what do you think is the biggest threat to hunting in, uh, 2021 here in the, in, in the social media age that we live in? Mm. Mm. Oh man. Um, I would, uh, I don't lack for, I'll be, you, I'm going to mute my mic. I'll be back in eight and a half hours. <laughs> you go easy. All uh, I was going to say is that we have a PR problem <laughs> as hunters right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, you know, as I sit here and think on it, if I, if I had to pick one, that's what I'm kind of, you know, whatever stumbling on. Um, there's, I mean, I think it has to be complacency and, and within our own community because there's no external threat we can't address. Yeah. If, if there wasn't uh, complacency or even outright laziness in, in some cases, um, because, you know, you look at the grizzly bear ban, hunting ban that happened because at its core, we didn't organize sufficiently. We didn't plan sufficiently to push back on what was a incredibly um, savvy and well-funded um, PR campaign. So it comes back for sure to what you're saying, we see we have a PR problem. We, we absolutely do. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and trust me when I say that, you know, if... <laughs> and I shall put this out there. If any incredibly wealthy individual out there wants to put money into a fund that a group of people can then use to absolutely positively eviscerate the anti hunting organizations on the planet through good, you know, uh, a concerted PR push back against them. Like, I mean, like going deep, like go into like some of the funding sources and say, well, yeah, by the way, that developer absolutely annihilated black bear and blacktail habitat and, you know, some mountainside in Coquitlam or mm -hmm. some, you know, aspect of a village in Whistler. Like, I mean, take the gloves off and fight back. Um, you know, call Ty, call Wacy, call me, reach out. Um, because I think we need to do that. Like we need to, um, take some organizations, uh, maybe not out of the picture, but, you know, make it clear that they aren't as high and mighty as they like to think they are. Um, so when I say like complacency and laziness within the community, don't take that as me not thinking there aren't external threats. I've had lots to say on that over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think that there needs to be, um, an arm of our community that's willing to, I don't, I don't it's not even fight dirty. It's just play politics, right? Like play it, play the game. Um, but I think if we don't also combine that with, um, a willingness to really try to understand all these things that are used against us, then it won't, it won't matter. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think too, with our, our money is gets, it's getting spread too thin, too far because there's too many different organizations and they want everybody to donate. And the fact of it is uh, just the average working man, he can't donate a pile of money. So they pick one, you know, they pick SCI or Rocky mountain or goat Alliance or whoever. And I wish there was just only a couple, all the money could go to, <clears throat> to, to, you know, a good, to a good fight because there's a lot of organizations out there, man, they don't do shit. And mm. it's, it's just that we're everything's there's too many. Just, everything's getting spread too thin. And um at the end of the day, I think we're just kind of spinning our wheels on some of this shit, you know. Yeah, I, I would agree with that for sure. We see and then again that comes back to I think, you know, diligence, right? Like do your research on where you're putting your money. You know, there's there's you know, look, you, you, everyone picks um an org or cause that speaks to them. I get that. Um, but you know, we also maybe not all know, but we all should know that if there's a, a black hole for how your money actually turns into action, it's nonprofits. Like what are, what are the, you know, the, the compensate, what's the compensation structure 
of that organization. Mm -hmm. You know, for every dollar put in, how many dollars end up, or even what worse, what percentage of that single dollar ends up doing what you think it's going to do. Um, I think we're lucky in the hunting community that most do right by that commit commitment. I think there are those that at least in some way are involved with the hunting community that you might question some of the, uh, accounting practices, let's say. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's publicly available information, right? Yeah. You can find it like, let's talk about raincoast conservation. <laughs> the, you know, you can find a lot out about them because they are a, a nonprofit and they have to publish a lot of documentation. You got to dig for it, but there's this thing called Google. That's an incredibly powerful tool that can help you find out a lot of stuff. And I'm not saying people in the hunting community fund raincoast, right? No, but, uh, or contribute to raincoast. Um, but most orgs, um, have to publish that, that information. <clears throat> and, um, you can find out a lot about how that money's being, being utilized. I mean, Wardo had a, Amazing idea kind of coming back to your point, Wacy. like here in, in BC over the past four or five years, um, we'll talk about Raincoast again, but they're not the only one. A lot of these so-called conservation organizations are actually pulling funds together to buy up outfitting territories so that no one will ever hunt grizzly bears there again. So this was before the ban, this was happening. And then since the ban and the event that it was to reopen, they just won't actually offer grizzly bear hunting services in those territories. Mm -hmm. I know a guy <clears throat> who sold his um, to a consortium that comes from that sort of community. Um, and there's a whole bunch of them and yep. some of them are getting some outfitters are chopping off that section of their, their outfit and selling it to them. Cause they're like, oh, they, just, they just don't want the hassle. They're literally getting harassed when they're out there or when they were out there mm -hmm. and they're just, it's, it's not worth it. Right. And so if there was one source of, uh, you know, a community, uh, like a, an organization that could be funded by the hunting community to buy those instead, well, we can protect access to those areas and the, the opportunity to hunt in those areas. If say the yeah. grizzly bear hunt came back or if there's, you know, other species in there as well. Mm -hmm. That's what, I, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like the, the anti hunting world, they're organized <laughs> and, and, oh, they, yeah. and they know what the fuck they're doing. So when we got all our money, you know, and, and Bill and Joe and Dave, they all donate their money to three different organizations and it all gets spent in different ways. And like, it's just, we can't get our freaking ducks in a row with this shit. And I think some guys, I wish, like I was saying, I wish there was just two options and it was either donate here or here. And, you know, I don't know, maybe that's not the right way to do it, but sometimes I, I, well, I think, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, and I even had a guy message me one time. He's like, I'm not donating anymore. He's like, I'm sick of spending, sending money and I don't see any results. You know, what do they mm -hmm. do? And he was talking about, um, I think like Pope and Young Club or something. And I'm like, yeah, well, mm. that's just another thing. Like, you know, they, they want your money. SCI wants your money. Everybody wants your money. But, and guys are just tired of not seeing results. You know, I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's a combination of, um, uh, money in the right org for sure. And then ensuring that we've got, you know, the right strategy in place. Mm. You know, if, if, if you keep flying your bombers over a, a city and they keep getting shot down, you might want to try something else. Yeah. What, uh, I know you're a big, uh, wild sheep foundation guy, Adam. Um, what are, mm -hmm. what conservation orgs are, are the ones that speak to you? Yeah. Well, WSF for sure. I've, um, been, you know, worked with them for a long time. Um, and, uh, WSSBC, obviously, mm -hmm. um, I was a member of RMEF. Uh, I'm not anymore. Was a member of the Mule Deer Foundation. What? Not anymore. Was a member of RMGA. Um, I actually just got my notice that it had lapsed. So I got to renew that one. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, when it comes to th those would be the big three WSF, RMGA and, uh, and, uh, WSSBC. Yeah. Um, and that comes back to obviously the ones that speak to me, um, in terms of, you know, the efforts they're putting forth, um, not, and not just in sheep country, right? Like WSF is, is helping fund act now and one campfire, which is, you know, 
uh, the brainchild of the Wild Sheep Society of BC. Mm-hmm. Wild Sheep Society of BC, as we know, is the one behind um, the Act Now campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, if you know the BC listeners are wondering why I haven't mentioned BCWF, I'd prefer to have that conversation in person, <laughs> but I'm happy to. Um, and um, and and then RMGA, yeah, I've just got a I got a soft spot for the for the goats, and yeah, think that if we don't. Um, <laughs> give them some love that, um, we won't have what we have, which we're, we're, you know, very fortunate to have here in BC and in many parts of the U S as well. Um, so those would be the three that I put my time and energy into the most right now. And I obviously know the inner workings in particular of WSF and WSSBC quite well and know that, you know, if dollars go in, they go out to the right places or the right initiatives. Yeah. Um, that's something that I, I struggled with when I was uh, getting into hunting, like where I wanted to, where I wanted to focus my time, spend my money and, and actually make a difference. Um, and yeah, no, I, I landed, it was kind of a, a question I knew the answer to when I asked you, Adam, but I'm, um, yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat there with, um, being, uh, what am I at Wild Sheep Society? I think I'm a Monarch member there. And then mm-hmm. at RMGA, I'm a life member. And then I think, at I don't know what I am at Wild Sheep Foundation. I gotta look at that, but yeah, those are all great orgs doing great things and they put your money to great use. And I mean, Wild Sheep Society here in BC, um, I mean, they should almost take just sheep out of the name. They, they, those guys are just killing it on all fronts. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Just, they should just be, yeah, hey, we're the guys. We'll take care of it. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, and I, th- and I think, um, you know, because there's a couple of ways that one can look at this, right? Um, the, you can spread you know, less money across a lot more organizations, which I've done, or you can find the ones that speak to you the most and and your passions the most. Um, and ideally learn more and more about what they're doing and, and double down, like almost like an investment strategy. Right. Um, and that's when I say like, I used to be with RMEF and used to be with MDF. It's not that I don't think they're doing good work at all. It's just, um, as I got more exposure to WSF, WS, uh, WSSBC and RMGA, um, I decided to, to reallocate more money to those organizations and their causes based on what I'd seen. Um, but that's not to say that it's not worth supporting, but you know, Ducks Unlimited, we could talk about for goodness sakes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of organizations and that comes back to your point, right? Wacy is it's hard to pick one or two or three. And I think you do have to bring that back to your own personal passions and interests and, Mm -hmm. and, and the initiatives, you know, they're, they're putting their time and energy into, but, um, you know, you can also choose to spread kind of equal love around, right? Like that, that works too. Um, I think what you said, we see though, does make sense. I'd rather see WSSBC and WSF have get even more to my pocket so they can be, really specific and really, really good at what they do, um, versus giving them less and not being able to see them carry that, that torch as far as I think they ought to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's about as deep and thoughtful as I can get right there. Sorry, folks. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Alrighty. Well, that was, that was two hours before, uh, 8am here for, for us, Wace. Mm-hmm. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hopping on here with us, Adam. And, uh, thanks for doing what you guys do and, and being, uh, how do I say it? Being, being leaders in the space and in giving people a lot of information that they need and a lot of, um, thought provoking stuff to get guys, uh, you know, heading down the right road to, uh, being, um, contributing members to our community. Right. Well, I, um, really appreciate, uh, you having me on man and, um, and, uh, and the obviously the kind words and it was, it was my pleasure and, um, you know, it was a great conversation. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Do you Anytime. want me to, uh, do you want me to end this with a Dodge Ram commercial? Absolutely. <laughs> More All than right, anything. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Are you tired of your wife driving you around? Do yourself a Ram 1500 Motor Trend Truck of the Year. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave us a review. If you want to support the podcast, please check out the gear on our website at wildernesslocals.net.